In this lesson, we are going to look at linear kinematics. Kinematics is the study of motion without concern for what's causing that motion. For this particular lesson, we are going to limit ourselves to looking in one dimension and one direction. So let's get started. Let's say I asked you how far away Grandma's house was. Now, probably tacit within that question is how far away is Grandma from here? It could equally be invalid to say, how far away is grandma from your house? How far away is grandma from school? Or how far away does grandma live from your parents? Each of those would give an equally valid answer. But if we don't have a mutually agreed upon starting place, we could be confused when we're talking to each other. Similarly, if you said that grandma lived east of here, we have to have a mutually agreed upon direction of east. It's the same thing whenever we're doing any type of biomechanical analysis. We must start with a frame of reference. Frame of references are going to begin with an origin. The origin is where your frame of reference starts. So if we're going to ask how far away is grandma, and you're going to say how far away is grandma from here, here becomes your origin. If you say how far away is grandma from your house, your house becomes your origin. Similarly, if you said how far away is grandma from your parents, then your parents' house becomes your origin. Next, we are going to extend the line infinitely far from that origin. Usually, but not always, that line is going to represent a spatial dimension, whether that be horizontal, vertical, lateral, north, south, east, or west, that line is going to extend infinitely far along a particular spatial dimension. That is known as our orientation. And then usually we're going to label it. By convention, usually, but not always, the horizontal direction is labeled as the x direction, but it could just as easily be y or z or something else. Next, we have to talk about this thing called sense. Even though we have an orientation, we still don't have a full description of the motion. Let's say that we have two points on that orientation, point A and point B. Well, going from left to right, or going from A to B would represent one sense, while going from B to A would represent the opposite sense. So if we put these two things together, orientation and sense, we end up with a direction. And if we have a direction and we have our origin, we have established our frame of reference. Now here's a CSUN map. A CSUN map has an origin, and it has directions associated with it. For starters, we can say that if we look along the bottom horizontal line, there is a dimension there, which is really going east-west, which we will call the letter dimension, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Then if we look along the right-hand side of the map, we see corresponding with the north-south dimension, a number dimension, which we'll call 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Now the origin would actually start at A0, which would probably be in the lower left-hand corner at Reseda Boulevard and Nordoff, or where California Chicken Cafe is. So that's going to be our frame of reference for the campus. Next, we have to establish a position. A position is simply going to be the location within the frame of reference. The position is going to be abbreviated with the letter P. So if we have our origin, and then we have our direction, the location on that line represents our position. Now we can draw a vector or an arrow that's going to go from the origin to that location, and that's going to be referred to as a position vector. And the longer that arrow is, the greater in magnitude the position is, or in other words, the further away from the origin that position actually is. Now, in kinesiology, we're not just interested in things, but we're interested in things moving or in things changing, because kinesiology is the study of movement. Well, displacement is the change in position. 
So again, if I have my origin and I have my direction and I have a location in my frame of reference, if I move to a new location, then I've had a displacement. That displacement is going to be abbreviated with the delta P. The delta means change in. So change in P is change in position or our displacement. And again, we would draw a arrow from our old position to our new position and then draw that arrow and that represents our displacement. Mathematically, we can say that change in position or delta P is equal to our new position minus our old position. Now there's a difference between a distance and a displacement. Let's say that I'm leaving California Chicken Cafe after having lunch and I need to get back to Redwood Hall for class. There are an infinite number of ways in which I can get there. One possible way is I can travel down Nordoff and then I can go up Lindley until I get to Redwood Hall. But if I think I'm going to be late for class, I might not exactly take that approach. I might cut through Sierra Hall, over by the Oviatt Library, past Jacaranda Hall, and get to Redwood Hall more immediately. Now, both of those two routes have the same displacement. Because I have the same final position and I have the same starting position, if I'm simply subtracting my final position minus my initial position, then my displacement is going to be the same. However, the distances it took in order for me to get there are going to be very different. The approach where I went down Nordoff and then went up Lindley is going to be longer than if I tried to make a straight path from California Chicken Cafe to Redwood Hall. Next, we have to define time. Lots of people have difficulty defining time. My personal favorite definitions are attributed to either Albert Einstein or buckaroo banzai, depending on whom you want to believe. And that is, time is the thing that prevents everything from happening at once. And while that might sound pretty deep, it's also pretty practical. If you think about it, you can't be in two different places at the same time. If you were in one place, and now you're someplace else, time had to elapse in order for you to get from A to B, because you cannot be in two different places at the same time. Our next kinematic variable is going to be velocity. Velocity is how fast you are moving, but not only how fast you're moving, but how fast you're moving in a particular direction. Let's take our two runners here. We have a man up on the top and we have a woman down on the bottom and they're going to race. And let's say that they're going to do a 100 meter race. And for our 100 meter race, let's say that we're gonna put the origin at the start line and then we are going to have our direction be the direction of the length of the track or to where they hit the finish line. So now I have my displacement is going to be that 100 meters. So I'm going to subtract the 100 meters from zero or my starting line and I get at my 100 meter displacement. So now they're going to race. On your mark, get set, go. And oh, she smoked them. She went much faster than she did, so she arrived at her final location before he did. I think that's somewhat intuitive to everybody, but let's put a little bit more of a formal spin on it. Our velocity is our change in position or our displacement divided by our change in time. Now looking at this, we can say that there are two ways in which velocity can be increased. Either A, we have to travel further for the same amount of time, or B, for the same distance, we have to get there in a shorter amount of time. And that's what happened with our two runners. Our two runners had the same displacement. They both went 100 meters, but our woman got there more quickly than the man did, and therefore she had to have had a greater velocity. Now, we can also manipulate our equation using simple algebra. And this allows us now to look at an equation for our displacement. And we can say our displacement is going to equal our velocity multiplied by our change in time. And again, now we want to know how far we displaced. That will depend on two variables, both our velocity as well as our change in time. So if we increase velocity, or if we've increased time, we are going to increase our displacement for that period of time. 
Finally, I can take my equation and I can basically swap my delta t and my v. And this will tell me something about how long it's going to take me to complete whatever route I'm looking at. That time is going to depend on the displacement as well as the velocity or how fast I'm going in that particular direction. So again, if I'm looking to minimize the amount of time, I have to either A, decrease the displacement. Decreasing the displacement probably isn't going to work if I'm running a 100 meter race because that displacement is going to be fixed. The other variable that I can work with is the velocity. So the only other way in which I can decrease the time is if I increase the velocity. If I increase the velocity, I'll end up decreasing the time it will take to complete the task, in this case, the 100 meter race, which is what happened in our example. So now let's look at a scenario where I have two bodies. I have body A and I have body B, and they have the same starting position in my x dimension. And they've displaced. Body B displaced more than body A over that same period of time. So what we can say is, is during that period of time, that body B had a greater velocity than did body A. Now we want to create a graph, and we want to represent this displacement as a function of time. So now we're going to put this one-dimensional representation into two dimensions, the dimensions being a spatial dimension, or the forward direction, as well as a time dimension. So what we're going to do is we are going to look at our displacement along our x dimension, and then we are going to rotate our x dimension up now you have to be careful here that this is going to be now a vertical axis even though we are talking about a horizontal dimension in real physical space. And then we are going to put on our horizontal axis here time. Now I hope you realize that this situation right here is going to be a foul. You can't be in two different positions at the same time. Body B can't be in the lower position and the upper position at the same time. Time is the thing that prevents everything from happening at once. So you can't be in two different positions at the same time. So that means we have to take body B's position and we have to move it on our time axis. So now we have a legitimate scenario where body B is in two different positions at two different points in time. And now what we can do is we can draw a straight line going from our initial position to our final position. That straight line is actually going to be a slope. That slope represents the velocity of body B. And again, if we look at our equation for a slope, it's going to be the change in y divided by the change in x. In this case, on the y is actually our x dimension of position, which I said where things can get a little confusing, but it's going to be our final position minus our initial position divided by our final time minus our initial time, which again is the equation that we just looked at for velocity. So now we physically defined velocity as being how fast we're going in a particular direction. We've mathematically defined velocity as being the change in position over the change in time. And now we've graphically represented velocity as the slope of the position time curve. So velo velocity is the slope of the position time curve. That means the displacement is the area under the velocity time curve. So if we were to plot velocity as a function of time, that area under the velocity time curve ends up being our displacement. And that's going to be an important concept that we'll come back to in a little bit. So whether we have a constant velocity going this way, or we have an increasing velocity this way, we can think of the displacement as being the area under the velocity time curve. So let's return back to our two bodies. We have body A and we have body B. And again, we're talking about those two bodies displacing during a particular point in time. Now, we said that if body B displaced more than body A in the same period of time, then body B had to have a greater velocity. 
Let's see if we can now represent that graphically. So let's put body A and body B on the same axis. And then we're going to rotate that axis and then put time as our second dimension. Now again, we have to call a foul right here. We have to call a foul because both body A and body B are occupying two different positions at the same point in time. And we already said this was a foul. This cannot happen. So what we have to do now is we have to align the second position for body A and body B where they need to be on the time axis. Then we can draw our straight lines going from their initial position, and they both started with the initial position, by the way, to their final position. And now what we can do is we can look at the slope. We can look at the slope both for body A as well as for body B. And we'll see here the steeper slope is represented by body B. Because B has the steeper slope, they are going to have the greater velocity. Now intuitively, we knew body B had a greater velocity than body A because body B covered the same amount of ground in a shorter period of time. Now we can reinforce that idea by looking at the slopes and seeing that yes, body B has a steeper slope than body A and therefore has a greater velocity. Now you might be thinking, is this velocity thing just the same thing as speed? And the answer to that is no, although they are similar to each other. Speed is simply how fast you are going. So it is going to be irrespective of direction. So if we are traveling on the 405 freeway and we're going north, and if we're traveling on the 405 freeway and we're going south, we will have the same speed represented in our car or our same speedometer or speed meter. And if we're on the 405, that probably means we're only going about 20 miles an hour. Okay. As we will see, particularly within our next lesson, when we talk about velocity, we are going to have a different velocity if we are going 20 miles an hour north or if we're going 20 miles an hour south. The magnitudes end up being the same, but the directions end up being different. So now let's say that we want to go to grandma's house. So I'm going to hop in my car and I'm going to try to drive over to grandma's house. Chances are I'm not going to go at the same velocity the entire time from start to finish. I'm going to get on the 405 and we all know how bad the traffic is on the 405. So what's probably going to happen is a graph of velocity versus time that looks something like this. I'm going to start at zero miles per hour when I first get in my car. And when I get on the freeway, I'm going to get up to about 80 miles an hour. And then I might see California Highway Patrol, so I might drop down to 50 miles an hour. Once I'm in the clear, I might go back up to 80, but eventually I'm going to get on the 405 and I'm going to drop down to 20. And then eventually I'm going to get to the Sepulveda Pass where I'm probably going to drop down to zero. And then maybe if I'm lucky and it's the right time of day, I can get back up to 80 degrees or I can get back up to 80 miles per hour before I end up ultimately ending at grandma's house and I'm back down to zero miles per hour. So this is going to transition us into an important concept, talking about average velocities versus instantaneous velocities. Let's say I have a graph here where I have position on my vertical axis and I have time on my horizontal axis. Now we've already said the slope of the position time curve ends up being my velocity. But if I were to simply draw a straight line from start to finish, that will be a slope and that will represent a velocity. In fact, that will represent the average velocity. That would be the velocity of I was going if I was going the same velocity the entire time. But we know that's not the case. We know I'm not going the same velocity the entire time, but my velocity is changing. So if I wanted to know how fast I was going at a particular point in time, I would draw a curve that would just kiss the graph at one point that line that just kissed that curve at that one particular point would be what we call the instantaneous velocity at that one particular point. 
and sometimes we're interested in the average velocity. If grandma lives 50 miles away and we know our average velocity is going to be 50 miles per hour, we know it's going to take about an hour to get to grandma's house. But that average velocity isn't going to tell us how fast we're going at any one particular point in time, and we certainly can't use it to get out of a speeding ticket. So again, if I just draw a straight line from my initial position to my final position as a function of time, that straight line represents the average velocity, and it's what my velocity would be if I was going a constant velocity the entire time. So again, constant velocities have a straight line. If I were to draw a line that would just kiss the curve at one particular point, that would represent the instantaneous velocity at that one particular point. Next, we can talk about relative velocity. While we certainly are concerned about how fast we're going in a particular direction, oftentimes what we really need to know is how fast we're going relative to an opponent or relative to the car in front of us. Right? It, that's what's really going to either cause or prevent this particular accident right here. It's not how fast that other car was going. It's how fast that car was going relative to the car in front of it. And that's what we call this idea of relative velocity. Now, when we look at this equation here, whenever we're talking about a body, the body is going to be in the trailing subscript. The reference frame is going to be in the leading superscript. So how we read this is that we say the velocity of body B with respect to body A, or in the frame of reference of body A, is going to be equal to the velocity of body B minus the velocity of body A. Now notice for velocity B and velocity A, I don't have any leading superscripts. And that's because if the Earth is going to be our frame of reference, then we usually ignore it just so we don't clutter up our equations. But it's really important to understand that in order for this equation to be valid, the velocity of B and the velocity of A both have to be expressed relative to the same frame of reference, in this case, Earth. So now let's take a little bit more of a vectorized approach to looking at it. In my top drawing right here, if we say that body A and body B have the same velocity and we put them right next to each other, then the relative velocity of A to B ends up being zero, which I'm just going to represent by this little dash right here. That means that the distance between A and B is going to remain the same while they have a relative velocity of zero. Now, what happens if velocity B is going faster than the velocity of body A. Well then, the relative velocity of B relative to A is going to be positive. That means that in terms of A's frame of reference, B is faster than that. B is speeding up, which you can tell by this positive vector right here. So if B was in front of A, B would continue to get further in front of A. If B was behind A, B would be continually catching up to A. Finally, we can have a scenario where A is going faster than B. In this case here, since it's body B minus body A, or the velocity of B minus the velocity of A, we are going to have a negative relative velocity. In this case, what that means is that from B's perspective, A is going faster. Or we can say, from the frame of reference of A, B is getting further away or B is slowing down. This is going to be really important if we say, look at a race. If we're looking at two bodies in a race, we can say during the first half of this race here, the relative velocity is negative. That means that B was actually going slower than A. So that means that A had a better start than B. But then, somewhere around the midpoint of the race, we now have a positive relative velocity. We have a positive relative velocity. That means that B is going faster than A. This still isn't going to tell us who won the race. 
it's all going to depend on whether or not A got so far out in front of B that B couldn't catch them, or if B was able to actually surpass A at some point in time. So we can't tell just by looking at the relative velocity here who won the race, but it'll give us some clues about why somebody may have won the race and what A runner may have to do differently. Our next kinematic variable is going to be acceleration. Acceleration is how quickly you are either speeding up or slowing down in a particular direction, or because, again, velocity is a vector, which means it has a magnitude and a direction, it could also mean how quickly you are changing directions. So let's take a look at acceleration a little more closely. You are all probably really familiar with acceleration if you've ever been in a car. If you've ever been in a car and you hit the gas, you accelerate or you speed up. If you hit the brakes, you end up slowing down. Now again, you can go from 0 to 60 rather abruptly, in which case you would have a high acceleration, or you could go from 0 to 60 relatively slowly, in which case you would have a more gradual acceleration. In both cases, your change in velocity was the same, 60 miles an hour if you went from 0 to 60. The difference with the acceleration piece is, is adding the time element, how quickly you got from 0 to 60. Or conversely, if you're hitting the brakes, you can gradually put on the brakes and slow from 60 to 0. Or you can slam on the brakes, have a higher acceleration, or what we call when we're slowing down a deceleration, in which case you are still have the same change in velocity. It's just much more abrupt if you're slamming on the brakes. So our equation for acceleration is the change in velocity over the change in time. And similar to how we analyzed our velocity, we can say that we will have a higher acceleration if we have a higher change in velocity for the same change in time, or if we have a decrease in time for the same change in velocity. And if we were to rearrange our equation here, we would see that our change in velocity is equal to our acceleration times our change in time. So if we want to know how much our velocity changed, we need to know something about the acceleration and the time period over which that body was accelerating. And that will give us an indication of our change in velocity. So again, if we have a higher acceleration and or a longer time over which that acceleration is applied, we will have a greater change in velocity. So now let's take a look at it graphically. Again, we will go back and we will look at body A. And body A has a position at one point, and then at another subsequent point in time, they have a different position. So that means that they have a velocity, and what's important here is that the velocity is going in that direction of travel. So we have a velocity that's pointing in the same direction as the displacement. Now, after a point in time, if that velocity is greater, and we know that velocity is greater here because we have a larger arrow, then that means we had to have an acceleration and a change in time. Because just like you can't be in two positions at the same point in time, you can't have two velocities at the same point in time. So that means we had to have two elements here. We had to have a change in time, and we had to have an acceleration. And if we are speeding up, we have to have an acceleration that is in the direction of the velocity vector. Okay. Conversely, if we are going with a certain velocity at another point in time, at another position, I have a smaller velocity. That means, again, my velocity has changed. And again, I need two elements here in order to change that velocity. Because you can't have two velocities at the same point in time, I have to have a period of time over which an acceleration is being applied. And if, if I am decreasing my velocity, that means that my acceleration has to be opposite of the direction of travel. So we can think of, if I am speeding up, I am hitting the gas. And if I'm slowing down, I'm hitting the brakes. Okay, if I'm speeding up, I have an acceleration in my direction of travel. If I'm slowing down, I still have an acceleration although often we will call that a deceleration, 
But if I have a deceleration, if I have a decrease in velocity, that means my acceleration vector is pointing opposite of my direction of travel. So let's go ahead and graph it. So we know that for body B right here, they have a velocity at one point, and then their velocity changes at another point in time. And so again, we have our time axis right here. If we looked at this graph just as it is, we'd have to throw the flag and we'd have to say, foul, you can't have two velocities at the same time. So what we have to do is we have to align our velocity for the point in time where that new velocity occurred. And then again, if we were to draw a straight line from our old velocity to our new velocity, we could say that that slope would be the acceleration. And again, that jibes with the math that we just looked at because the acceleration is the change in velocity over the change in time, which is mathematically represented by the slope when we have the velocity on the vertical axis and we have the time on the horizontal axis. So acceleration is the slope of the velocity time curve. That means the change in the velocity is the area under the acceleration time curve. So if we look at an acceleration time curve, the area under that acceleration time curve is our change in velocity. Whether it looks like this, or it looks like this, or it looks like some other funky curve, the area under the acceleration time curve is our change in velocity. And again, that's going to be an important component that we will get to here in a couple minutes. So let's look at a fairly familiar task. We are going to bring a cup from arm's length away, and we're going to bring it from our mouth so we can take a sip of our tasty beverage. What is the velocity of that cup at the start? Well, in this case, we're going to say that the velocity is going to end up being zero. Now, when that cup ends up moving, it's going to move from its initial position to its final position. And when it gets to its final position, the velocity of that cup when it gets to my mouth had better be zero because if it's not, I'm going to be in for some pretty intense dental work. So we can say here that in a lot of human activities, we are going to have a movement that starts with zero velocity and it ends with zero velocity. This series of graphs right here represent the position versus time the velocity versus time, and the acceleration versus time of just that scenario where a body is starting with zero velocity and ending with zero velocity. And you'll note that the position time curve kind of has like this lazy S shape to it. Our velocity time curve has more or less this bell-shaped curve to it. And that's going to be important because initially we're going to start with zero velocity and then we have to speed up, which is why you see we get to this peak right around the middle of that velocity time curve. And then we have to slow down to get to back down to zero velocity when I get there. Also note here that because my direction of travel and the velocity is always in that direction of travel, the velocity is always positive if I'm moving in the positive direction. And then finally, look at my acceleration graph. For my acceleration, during the first part of the movement, where the velocity is increasing or where the person is speeding up or where the cup is speeding up, I'm going to have a positive acceleration. And this holds when I'm going in a positive direction. We'll see later what happens if I'm going in a negative direction. But then I have to slow down in order to get to zero. So that means I have to have an acceleration which is opposite of that direction of travel, which means it has to be, in this case, a negative acceleration. So again, I'm going to have a velocity time curve, which is going to look kind of like this bell curve right here, where first I will speed up, I'm going to hit some maximal amount of velocity somewhere around the middle, and then I'm going to slow down. So again, if we look here, we can say my displacement is going to go from left to right in the positive direction. First, I'm going to speed up, so I'm going to have an acceleration that's in that same direction that I'm moving until I hit some sort of peak velocity. And then somewhere around the middle of the movement or so, depending on how the person's performing the task, I have to start slowing down if I'm going to have zero velocity at the end. So if I'm going to have zero velocity at the end, I have to have an acceleration that's opposite of the direction of travel. In this case, since I'm traveling in the positive direction, that acceleration has to be in the negative direction. 
and that will slow me down until I get to zero where that cup stops at my mouth. So again, if we look at what's happening here, and if we look at the velocity curve and the acceleration curve, we can see that my slope on my velocity curve is initially going to be positive. I'm initially going to be going uphill. That represents a positive slope. That represents a positive acceleration. Then you can see right at the midpoint, right at my peak, I'm not going up or coming down. I'm just flat there, at least instantaneously, in which case my slope would be zero in which means I would have a zero acceleration just for that one instant in time. And then I'm going to have a negative slope. I'm going to start rolling downhill on that velocity time curve. And if I'm rolling downhill on that velocity time curve, I have a negative slope. That means I have a negative acceleration. Okay. And again, if we look at the areas under the curves, the area under the velocity time curve represents displacement. And that's all positive because I'm going in the positive direction. But now if we look at the acceleration time curve, we see that I have a positive area and I have a negative area. The positive area represents a change in velocity. The negative area represents a change in velocity. Well, if I start with zero velocity and I end with zero velocity, my total change in velocity ends up being zero. And that means that the positive area and the negative area have to cancel each other out. They have to, if they don't, then that means I don't have zero velocity at the end. Okay, so that's a really important point that I'd just like to reemphasize. If I'm starting with zero velocity and I'm ending with zero velocity, that means my overall change in velocity is going to be zero. But I still have a velocity in between, otherwise I'm not moving. It just means that the positive area under the curve and the negative area under the curve have to cancel each other out. They don't have to be symmetric, but they, the two areas have to be equal. OK, with that said, let's look at a few practical applications. First, let's look at Coach I Am Strong. Coach I Am Strong heard somewhere that in order to be fast, you have to train fast. And so he is having all of his athletes squat as fast as they possibly can. Now, I'm sure you probably already know that if you're squatting really heavy you can't go really fast so what coach strong decides he's going to do is he's going to decrease the weight and have his athletes move as fast as he possibly can is this a good idea or is this a bad idea i'm not going to give you the answer right now we're going to wait for class in order to give you that answer next let's look at gait the definition of gait is locomotion, specifically locomotion over land. So we can talk about walking gait, we can talk about running gait, we can talk about crawling gait, we can talk about skipping gait, hopping gait, galloping gait, whatever gait it is we want to talk about. But for most adult humans, we usually leave gait to be either walking or running. Now, a few terms just to reacquaint you with that you should have already had in your study of gait. The first is step. A step is from initial contact of one foot to initial contact of that next foot. So if we have right initial contact to left initial contact, that is going to define a step. Now a stride is going to be from the initial contact of one foot back to the initial contact of that same foot. So if we go from a right initial contact to a right initial contact, that's going to be a stride. So a step length is the actual physical length from right initial contact to left initial contact or left initial contact to right initial contact. And stride length is going to be the actual physical length from right initial contact back to right initial contact or left initial contact back to left initial contact. If we look at a hierarchical model of gait, we can see that our gait velocity is going to be equal to our step length times our step rate. Other terms that you hear for step rate could be step frequency or even cadence. Now, another point that I will make here is that we are using step and step. 
You could also use stride and stride if you wanted to use stride and stride. And in class, I'll ask you when we might want to use step versus when we might want to use stride. But it's important to realize here that you can't mix the two. If you're using step length, you have to use step rate. If you're using step rate, you have to use step length. If you're using stride rate, then you have to use stride length. You can't mix step length and stride rate together. It has to be one or the other. Now, our equation will tell us that if you increase step length or if you increase step rate, you are going to end up increasing your gate velocity. Now, I will say that there are limits to both, and that's something we'll explore throughout the rest of the course. But for now, keep in mind that if we increase one or the other, and it doesn't matter which one we increase, then we're going to have an increase in gate velocity. It's also important to realize here that we aren't raising step length or step rate to a higher power or multiplying one by two and not the other. So we can say here that at least all other things being equal, step length and step rate are equally important in increasing gate velocity. That applies to racers. It also applies to the elderly. If we want to try to improve grandpa's gate velocity, we would have to improve it the same way. There are only two things. If I go back here for a second, there are only two ways of increasing your gate velocity. You can either increase your step length or you can increase your step rate. So it doesn't matter if you are a world-class track athlete or if you're a grandpa walking down the street those are the only two possible ways in which we can increase our gate velocity.